All right, welcome uh, to everybody to this uh, staff B call. Um, I think we also have a couple uh, BitCop folks from the CDC, so thanks to Scott Sammons uh, for inviting our, our federal partners on this call. Um, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, COVID sequencing methodologies um, and also the analytical approaches uh, for generating uh, the, the consensus assemblies and also do performing the genomic epidemiology. Um, in this call, I wanted to start off in giving a, a quick primer on um, at least my best understanding of the different approaches available to states, both on the wet lab and the dry lab side. Uh, there's a number of different protocols available to everybody. Um, and I think Duncan did a fantastic job outlining many of those resources on the uh, CDC's um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, resource page that I've linked to in the slide. So I'll get into that in a second. Um, but like I said, I'm gonna give this quick presentation, uh, probably about 15 or 20 minutes afterwards. Um, hopefully we can facilitate some conversation so we can get some common ground on how we wanna standardize as much as possible to states uh, so that we we're, we're perform the same sort of analytical processes so that we can have uh, data that can transcend um, not only our, our state boundaries, but also international boundaries. And I'll touch on that a little bit um, as I get on. So if someone can just for a quick second, let me know that you can see my slides. Yep, we can see them. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to be talking about the sequencing and bioinformatics approaches uh, for the end goal of performing some sort of genomic epidemiology to inform uh, the public health decisions regarding this uh, COVID global outbreak at both the international and the local scale. Um, before I say anything though, uh, especially with the state laboratories um, listening in on this, I think it's, it's, it's pertinent uh, for me to, to recognize um, and let everyone know that diagnostic testings are the, the first priority to um, being able to, to, to allow public health laboratories to make action that actually flatten this curve. Um, sequencing technology, you know, I think this is, this is the last group I have to, to, to advocate this for, but um, it's definitely gonna supplement the data we have from diagnostic testings, uh, but it is still second tier to our, our ability to uh, rapidly diagnose um, these cases when they come along. Um, so with that said, with the sequencing protocols, um, I think first, it, it, it's, it's important to realize what we're, our starting material is that we're working from, um, and that is the RNA extract um, that is that is uh, extracted from uh, the RT-PCR diagnostics assay um, released by the CDC. So um, keeping this in mind, it's important because uh, the, the volume of starting material is, uh, is something, to, something of note there. Hey guys, if you can do me a huge favor on, on muting your microphones, um, that would be fantastic. Um, but yeah, so, so when you're looking at sequencing approaches, it's, it's important to keep in mind how much RNA volume you have, um, and I'll get into the different methods and, and explain why that, that might be a limiting factor uh, for what's feasible for states to, uh, to, to adopt in terms of a sequencing procedure. So from the RNA extract uh, material, um, the hope is for laboratories, once they have a positive result, uh, to be able to perform genomic epidemiology. But then the, the two massive steps and the two massive um, sort of ambiguities right now are um, how do we sequence? Uh, these genomes, and then how do we analyze these genomes? Um, and, and the hope is to get to a sequence assembly that can then lead into performing uh, these phylogenetic inferences that will inform some public health action. Um, right now, from the RNA extract, uh, I think many of you guys are going to notice the different papers surrounding the different methodologies. I wanted to kind of broadly touch on many of these method methods. Uh, but also state that there's, there's very few or there's a, at least a, a subcategory of these methods that I'm going to mention that are most applicable uh, to scaling up and doing routinely at the state laboratory. So these first two methods have, have proven useful, especially in um, things like the Ebola outbreak, but may not be as useful in the, the, the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, and that's uh, the direct RNA sequencing and metagenomic sequencing. And the limitation there uh, being one for direct RNA, I think, uh, a level of subject matter expertise at the state level. Um, but then also, especially with the metagenomics, is, is actually the, the viral load available to us uh, once state laboratories um, have that aliquot 
of RNA extract. So the, the other two methodologies that, um, at least from my perspective, uh, that is most um, appropriate for state labs to start considering is an enrichment, a target enrichment based protocol uh, where there's genes of interest that are um, identified and then the clonal amplification happens on a sort of pull down of uh, the sequences of interest. And those, of course, would be DNA probes specifically for uh, the RNA virus of uh, SC2. Um, and then the other, the other methodology that we're seeing really ramp up is uh, PCR tiling. So um, from the closed, or not closed, I guess, from the, the complete genome of the virus, um, the, the folks of the Arctic network have identified primer sites um, throughout the entirety of the SC2 genome that will allow amplification uh, throughout the entirety uh, of the virus. Um, and so far, this seems to be um, the focus of many labs. Uh, the SC2 enrichment may also be something that, that we can uh, adopt at scale. Um, and this is something pretty active in development with Illumina. They have a Nextair Flex Kit um, that's going to be a DNA probe based uh, to, to enrich for SC2 uh, genome. However, that hasn't been released, so uh, I'm going to be focusing a lot of my talk here on the PCR tiling amplicon approach uh, put together by Arctic. Um, so the uh, Arctic Network, this is a, a European-based um, consortium where, where they're focusing on exactly this, the, the genomic, pan or I'm sorry, the uh, viral pandemics uh, such as COVID-19. Um, in that group, uh, they've developed a complete primer set for the genome sequencing. Uh, the first version of these primers were made available um, in January. Uh, I will say of the state adoption, we already have two state laboratories that have utilized these Arctic primers um, for uh, SC2 sequencing and, and analysis. So that's, um, I think it's credit where credit is due with Utah and, and Minnesota really pioneering and showing us how um, we, can, we can adopt this, this protocol effectively. Um, there are some, some modifications to be made on this, uh, on this primer set, so uh, be on the lookout for the, the second release later this month, and there's already um, some chatter about an even more optimized approach with V3 and having those primers actually pre-pooled by the manufacturer before distribution, which would save um, you know, some lab time at the, at, the, uh, at the ground level there. Um, so when considering the Arctic Amplicon sequencing, uh, because we have Amplicon products, um, you have a, a number of different platforms you can choose from, really any sequencing platform available, any next-gen sequencing platform. Uh, the, the, the protocol was originally developed with the Oxford, Nanotor uh, Oxford Nanopore Technology MinION device. So um, Utah, had, Utah and Minnesota actually utilized the ONT MinION for uh, the Amplicon sequencing. Um, Utah also elected to do the Illumina. I think they had MySeq data um, they generated, but it, it, it's it's a you know a cDNA library there, so you can sequence on any platform of your choice. Um, and then from these uh, sequencing read data, the the objective is to get to a genome assembly that can be then deposited to these international repositories uh, for surveillance of this this outbreak. And if you're using the uh, Arctic PCR amplicons in sequencing with the MinION device, uh, the analysis is, is, has made, been made relatively straightforward by the Arctic network. They've, uh, they've made their bioinformatics pipeline openly and publicly available and distributable as well um, through a Conda environment. Uh, there's also a number of public health scientists, um, including Kelsey Floric from Wisconsin Public Health, who's working to uh, containerize um, and uh, containerize the Arctic uh, workflow and also get it um, into a Nextflow environment so that uh, there's a little bit of a dynamic scalability um, in that, that workflow there. And again, from that, you are uh, provided with uh, a genome assembly um, that is ready for uh, distribution and analysis downstream. Uh, for those of you who are using the Illumina MySeq, there isn't, um, uh, at least at the moment, for, as far as I, I, my understanding, um, released by Arctic for uh, sequence analysis. So uh, this is where um, a lot of really the international bioinformatics community has, has been actively chattering on, okay, what is the best approach uh, to analyze these read data um, if you're not using the, uh, the originally designed uh, ONT protocol 
for the Arctic PCR amplicons. Um, and so whenever you're looking at this analysis, I think there's a, a couple major factors, especially as bioinformatics scientists, that we need to consider. Um, the, the preferred approach has been to use a mapping-based genome assembly rather than de novo. Um, and uh, Nick Lohman of, of the Arctic Network actually put out a great primer uh, describing um, their position on de novo versus uh, mapping-based um, in, in terms of the, uh, the assumptions that happening with the, the de Bruin approaches versus the mapping approaches. So uh, mapping to a reference genome for consensus sequence seems to be the, uh, the sort of um, consensus, no pun intended, but the consensus opinion from the bioinformatics community. Uh, but when you perform this technique, it's important to remember that um, the remapping will not be complete. Uh, this is for a number of reasons. Um, the two to, to consider is first, uh, like I said, this is the first version of the primers being released by the Arctic Network. Um, so there are, have been instances of uh, PCR failure. So there may be regions that you see that just did not get sequenced. Um, another important bit to, to, to realize is that um, the primers should be excluded from the final assembly. And when excluding these primer regions, you're going to have regions of ambiguities or ends in that final consensus assembly. Um, and, and try to bring that, that, uh, that message home. If you guys, uh, you know, walk through the, the PCR protocol, I think you'll, you'll, you'll hopefully understand the, the significance of actually removing that read data. So when, when the, the PCR reaction is happening, we have our target molecule and we have our primer sets um, and we generate our amplicon. And when we move on to sequencing, we're sequencing the entirety of that amplicon. So our read data includes that primer sequence. Um, and while the hybridization did occur between the primer and the target molecule, um, it's important to note that some mutations may have occurred at that uh, primer site. Um, so if you have that read data and you don't trim out that uh, primer sequence, you're, you're making an assumption that there has been no mutation at these primer sites. So what seems to be best practice is to actually perform some sort of primer trimming so that you have read data um, that is of your target molecule only. Um, and then you map these read data to the reference genome. In doing this, you will have gaps in your genome assembly. Um, I think if you're using the Arctic V1 protocol, the primer sequences add up to around 5,000 uh, base pairs um, of a 30,000 base pair genome. So just keep that in mind whenever you're generating your assemblies. Um, um, I don't think that for the Arctic primers, I don't think that's too much of a worry because the primers are tiled. And so you'll have uh, multiple amplicons that are covering a region. So when you uh, remove your primer sequence, there's another amplicon that should be covering that region instead. Because uh, the primer pairs are about 100 base pairs apart. So they don't overlap. That's true too. But I, I was also thinking about the, the, the actual absolute five prime and three prime end as well, Aaron. Like, I feel like at those ends, we, because there's no overlap, we'd have absolutely no data. So removing that sequence data, uh, the primer data would be advisable, but then you'd have the overlap sequences um, in the consensus assembly that are mid-assembly. Is that and fair to say? 5KB, that's, that's not 5KB if you're thinking about five primer and three primer end. Can you say that again, Sean? You were saying that if you trim off the, all the primers um, and exclude it from the mapping, then you are losing a big chunk uh, and you are creating a bigger gap. But um, like uh, Aaron just mentioned that um, you got those primers covered by a tile fashion. And if you're just worried about the five, five primer and three primer and the actual gap is very minimal. Um, sure, sure. No, and I think that's an important point. And I think I should clarify. Um, when we're seeing the most uh, ambiguous calls, it's also, well, at least from what I can tell, there's some sort of PCR failure happening um, mid-assembly. So in, in at least the, the limited read data that I've been uh, given access to, um, because of the PCR failure and because of excluding the sequence, uh, the primer sets, um, I'm seeing around, you know, 2% of the genome being excluded from the final consensus assembly. Uh, 
Okay. Um, but given that, uh, the, the sort of workflow that uh, we've started harking together um, is uh, at least a DCLS, and, and I'd love to get feedback on everyone else on this as well, is first quality trimming and adapter removal um, using a tool like Seeky Clean, um, then mapping to the reference genome, something like Minimap, uh, and then trimming the adapter regions from the read data, and then generating a consensus sequence um, with the unknown sequences also labeled uh, as an N rather than an actual uh, uh, filling, well, rather than inheriting the reference uh, nucleotide. Um, so if, if there's areas of low coverage or no coverage, um, including the, uh, the, the ambiguous IUPAC ambiguity uh, nucleotide, so the N in, the, in those cases. Um, in terms of assessing the quality of, of the read alignment, um, Aaron, you know, this is adapted from something that Aaron uh, showed me just using the SAM tools coverage and looking at, you know, how many bases aligned, what is the percent coverage of the entirety of the genome, and you can see most of, of, of the reads that, you know, I'm looking at at least uh, one to two percent seems to be um, right within the ballpark of the V1 primers. Uh, if you're getting above that, 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 like you can see in this sample four, for example, um, there might be something happening uh, in the actual PC. It might be worth a resequence uh, of that library, or maybe even a, a re-multiplex PCR. Um, okay, and then so once you have these genome assemblies, uh, I think most of us, are, our goal is to, to deposit these to the international repositories, uh, like the GIS AID, um, which is linked to NextStrain, um, and also making the read data available um, through SRA as well as GenBank. Um, on NCBI. Um, and at that level, uh, that's where we're seeing, especially with NextStrain, a lot of the international surveillance. Um, I'd imagine most in this group are aware of NextStrain. If you're not, I would uh, highly recommend um, going to the site and seeing the epidemiological narratives that, that, are, uh, that they're able to draw given the, the sequence analysis. And, and this really shows the power um, that sequencing data uh, can add to our, our our, our fight against this global pandemic. Um, and then at the local level, we, we really hope to do exactly the same thing that's happening at the international level, but rather than, you know, these color coding being, being countries, we're looking at, you know, facility A through C and looking at the, the local distribution of the pathogen so that we can start to assess uh, things like community transmission versus um, induction events um, and, and identify the, the geographical hotspots um, the, the evolution of, of the bug um, and make more informed decisions at the local level. Um, also, so things I think that are also important to consider whenever you, so say for example, you have a protocol decided upon, you have RNA extraction, um, you have the, uh, you, you've chosen to do Illumina, you have a mapping and, and assembly process and all these things. Um, it, it's going to take some time and resources to be able to do this. So I think things to consider are what are your sequencing and bioinformatics capabilities, um, especially with the, 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 the incredible burden of uh, doing diagnostic testings. Um, in terms of turnaround time, this could take anywhere from two to four days, uh, especially doing the Arctic uh, protocol with the PCR tiling. Um, you're seeing uh, a lot of time, uh, I think up to 12 hours, um, some reporting. Um, with that protocol and then another, you know, day or two for the library prep and sequencing, and then finally getting it up on next train. It could take, you know, a full business week. Um, another thing to consider too is now that industry laboratories are, um, are doing some of these diagnostic testings, um, you're getting the viral transport media. So you may not be getting an RNA extract. So um, you may not be able to even perform the sequencing unless you, you have a laboratory that, that would uh, want to, do the RNA extraction itself, uh, but then that gets into questions about, you know, conservation of RNA extraction kits, or if you want to do, you know, sort of a homebrew extraction, that's also a viable approach. Um, sequencing priorities, I think this is something that we're all going to have to start thinking about as well, uh, which isolates are, uh, are need to be brought to sequencing to, to, to refine the resolution of our understanding of the spread of the, uh, of the bug. Um, and yeah, so these are all sort of the open questions uh, that are still available or that are still, um, you know, not solved, I think uh, that we're all going to be running into if, if we, uh, even if once we establish a sequencing and analysis workflow in public health laboratories. Um, so that's sort of the, the high level approach or high level uh, view of everything that 
um, I've been able to gather. A lot of these resources I, I, I gleaned and information I've gleaned from um, the articles and uh, links from uh, the CDC repository on uh, SC2 sequencing. Um, for those of you, again, who aren't familiar with NextStrain, uh, please, please check out that link and, and see uh, the, the, the value in, in, in generating these kinds of data. Um, I will also say, too, I'm trying to make everything um, that I've written on my side available through the Staff B Toolkit. Um, it, it, things right now are on the dev branch, but I do have uh, a workflow that we've called Monroe that does do the um, read mapping, primer trimming, uh, and quality control for uh, SC2 genome assembly uh, that I mentioned there. So um, it, it would be helpful for to get some feedback on those tools and hopefully, uh, you know, distribute the capabilities across uh, our network. Uh, but with that, yeah, I think uh, I kind of just wanted to open up the conversation from there. I think already you guys are bringing up good points, Aaron, with the the, uh, the the removal of the primer sequences and things like that. But yeah, you're right. It's it's not in every region that, you know, uh, we're going to miss that sequencing because of the tiling and the overlapping. We should be able to get the complete genome. I should have uh, emphasized, but with those two caveats of PCR failure and uh, the end, the five prime and three prime end, of the genomes that I've been able to analyze, I've seen up to around 5,000 uh, nucleotide positions uh, missing in the final assembly. Nonetheless, when you see that, I think it still has added an incredible added value um, over just having diagnostic testing um, in terms of uh, resolving how this, how this bug is spreading across uh, your local area and also across the globe. All right, so with that, if you guys have any questions, um, especially, yeah, I'm really curious uh, from the BitCop folks. Um, one thing I think a lot of the state labs uh, would like to know is what, what their the approach is happening at the CDC level, if there's anyone who can offer insight. I know the, the, there's, there's definitely a review process that needs to happen to, to, to make the scripts um, available and, and distributed to the state level. Um, but if, if uh, at least some sort of um, high level overview of what's happening, if you know, what, what we're doing here at the state level is completely off at this point, or if we're also, you know, in line with uh, what's happening at the CDC, I think that would be helpful to know as well. And keep in mind, mics are mic'd, so if someone's trying to speak, uh, you're going to have to go ahead and un unmute your microphone. Hey, Kevin, this is Greg in Delaware. I figured I'll get it hey, started. Hey, Greg. How's it going, man? So, yeah, you did a good topic because uh, we got people running all over the place trying to get, you know, PCR done. And so I, I'm i trying to coordinate some sort of, um, you know, AMD capacity here with things being run all over the place. And so I'm curious what other people think about using, you know, long read sequencing and the error rates that come up with that type of sequencing. Is that a concern because of, um, you know, RNA viruses and how mutation rates and is that a concern with trying to track epi you know purposes compared to lumina and then the the hand you know hands on that's um i don't know how many people you have to do pcr steps and so i'm curious i was looking at the lumina's process and just doing shotgun sequencing which i know it's you know it's, it's overkill but again sometimes you get a lot of useful information that might be useful beyond the facts i'm just curious what other labs are looking at uh, I talked to Cosmos. I'm curious if anyone spoke to Cosmos in Maryland with their, um, you know, participation is they have a um, partnership with Illumina to do some um, downstream uh, bio bioanalytics. So I'll start it off there. I actually think um, Aaron and Sean would be the best representatives because they've used both. I think between the two of them, they have experience with all three of those technologies. Uh, Sean, you you had experience with trying to do the metagenomics shotgun approach uh, and the nanopore, and then Aaron, you've looked at both nanopore and uh, Illumina data using the Arctic primers. So if you guys can speak to that, I think that would be really helpful. Um, sure, I can start. So um, let me see where. Okay. Um, first of all, yes, we did try the metagenomic metagenomic approach. Um, um, that is because we're still waiting for the um, Arctic climbers um, to arrive for the IDT, and we have the first case, so I decided to jump in. Um, and also, previously, we have published a paper using the metagenomic approach to do some of the uh, RSV work. 
Um, but the problem is, and we found out later that um, um, after the viral processing, you know, the, the liquid is or it goes straight to the um, RNA extraction and then do the PCR. So we have to uh, basically help with the, the PCR process and use the uh, extracted RNA leftovers to do metagenomics. Um, is, you know, we have like um, a random primer set um, actually developed by CDC and we use the, the same um, random primer set for first strain synthesis and second strain synthesis. Uh, basically, it, you know, the random primer set had a bunch of N at the end. Uh, we did the library prep sequencing. Uh, I think for that particular specimen, we have 3 million reads at the end, um, but we only have like around 500 COVID-19 sequences. So um, the take-home the take message is basically, um, if you want to start with um, your um, um, after viral processing specimens, you need to do uh, a high concentration uh, to get, you know, to sort of like in, to do a, a viral particle enrichment and then to do the viral RNA extraction and then go with your uh, medical approach. Now that makes me quite interested, I mean, up to, up to, yes, is to try the, um, I think that person presented at the CDC, Nanotrap. Um, it's a called nanotrap, uh, maybe to see if, you know, that can actually do some interesting work in terms of um, metagenomic sequencing of, of COVID-19. But in this case, um, the metagenomic will not work. Uh, so that's, that's my uh, um, sort of my input in terms of, of that. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I think one of the unique things about Delaware is that we're centralized and so, I have all the extracts right here, and I can um, I can get that frozen quickly, so I can prioritize yeah. doing that work. So, or you, if you have extra RNA extraction kit, which you know is kind of like the, the gold on the market now. Um, you can you can try and spin the hell out of the specimens and do another separate RNA extraction and do the metagenomic approach. Um, but we do not have the um, privilege to do that. Um, uh, so that's the reason we switched to, to the Oxford Nanopore approach uh, using the Arctic uh, protocol. This um, is, if I could just jump in right there, this is Clint from CDC. We've um, done a lot of sequencing of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 genomes here. Uh, what we found for the metagenomic approach is anything that was under about CT20 was, was fairly easy to get with sort of random sequencing approaches. Anything above that was real spotty. Uh, we've been using, for the most part, a multiplex PCR strategy, uh, similar to the Arctic one. It was developed at the same time, but we've refined it. Hopefully, we'll be publishing that very soon. Uh, two comments, Clint. One, sure. I have spreadsheet organizing. Um, now, it's about 100 positive um, specimens we tested. Um, none of it are under 20. Um, or, well, one or two. Some, some of the early ones we got from uh, Washington and from California, and I think Illinois as well, were, were under CT20. Um, but I think most of ours has fallen between like 22 and uh, 29 with uh, several we over 30. The example of you know, 33, 34. Um, so yes, it's all over the place, but uh, the majority of the specimen or positive specimen with the CT value are um, above 20. The, the second comment is like, you know, we, at this point, unless you can surely guarantee us that the CDC protocol will be released within the next couple of hours, then I would suggest everybody to go with Arctic protocol. But, you know, That's fine. I and told, so I was told CDC protocol will be released three weeks ago. So Clint, do you have a time frame on that yet? Uh, well, I'm hopefully I just sent an email to see if we could at least put up the primers right now. Um, but uh, I, it's out of you know, sort of out of my control. Yeah, no worries. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I also meant to put you on the spot. 
<laughs> no worries. But you know, regardless of that, you know, the the strategy we've been using to generate consensus sequences is uh, a read based or read mapping based approach with a Madaka polishing step. And that's really the only way we've gotten sort of acceptable uh, consensus out of the nanopore data. And so I would suggest that that we all do that, and then we can put the details about that on the website as well. Additionally to that, we've been using uh, influenza's. Uh, read mapping, iterative read mapping assembler. Uh, and it works actually fairly well too as an, as an alternative to Madaka. Um, it, you know, the, the sort of one of the problems with it though is when you do have regions where amplicons drop out, you will get a, you know, um, what looks like a deletion when there's not a deletion. And it's important to look for these deletions though, because we have seen some legitimate ones uh, in different uh, parts of the genome uh, that we're, we're trying to keep track of. And, and um, another point I want to uh, make is for I'm particularly interested with the Utah's approach um, with the um, um, uh, multiplex PCR and then my seq sequencing because not everybody has a minion in hand and um, have plenty of experience doing minion sequencing. So, um, but majority of the state public health labs do have at least my seq slash I seq whatever seq that is. Uh, so if you know everybody can bring up that, I think that will benefit um, the majority of us. Um, yeah, sure. Can... Oh, so um, here at Utah, what we did, and I haven't done the library protocol, so I'm not the right person to tell you how to prepare the library. Um, but we did follow the Arctic protocol through the PCR step um, with the multiplex primers and then we split that in half and put the sequences on both the myseq and the nanopore sequences um, i don't have that analysis done um, because i made the mistake of letting uh, minnow do my demultiplexing for me um, and then i when i ran the arctic protocol on my demultiplexed and trimmed reads. Um, I lost quite a few reads and I haven't had time to redo that analysis, but I'm hoping to have like a clear answer for you guys next week. Yeah, Aaron, thanks for sharing that because that's actually kind of an important point. So the Arctic bioinformatics workflow, um, they've made that available in a conda environment, but there's, there's kind of um, some strong assumptions, or not even really strong assumptions, it's pretty fair assumptions that um, you're doing the base calling in that environment and the D uh, and then the multi demultiplexing in that environment as well. Um, I, if, I think Kelsey's on the line as well, who's working in uh, to put an environment together with a NextFlow uh, pipeline that can sort of hopefully separate those two, uh, those two environments so that you might have, especially if you have like cloud computing capabilities, you can do the, uh, the base calling and demultiplexing in, in a like a GPU optimized environment. And then you'd have you'd be able to do the downstream analysis in a different environment. Kelsey, am I speaking within the realm of reality there? Yeah. So I mean I've basically put together a couple of Docker containers. Um, one that's for the Arctic bioinformatics workflow that's kind of set up already in a conda environment. It's set up now in a Docker environment and seems to work fine. I'm actually looking for people willing to kind of test and work on that. Um, and then I've been using a, um, a previously developed uh, Docker container that runs the uh, Minion Guppy protocol for the base calling and everything. And I've been wrapping that all together in a Nextflow that again, I'm trying to just work through some of the bugs on, but hopefully soon we'll have available for anybody to use. Yeah, and hopefully that's something we can also, for those of you who are already using the Staff Feed Toolkit, this is something that Kelsey and I have been working on, is, is getting all these things available and distributable uh, to the state laboratories. Um, oh, and then I should have also mentioned, and Duncan, maybe you can uh, hearken on this too, there's also a number of industry collaborators who, who've offered their services. Um, I should have probably invited uh, Jonathan Jacobs on this, but uh, CLC Genomics Workbench um, has also made their pro tier license available to uh, public health laboratories that uh, will be doing um, SE2 analysis. Duncan, do you have any more that you can add to that maybe? 
Yeah, uh, let me let me frame this by saying that this isn't an endorsement or uh, or support in any way, shape, or form. Um, but a number of vendors uh, in the private sector have stepped forward with uh, with various offers. So uh, to answer Greg's question earlier, um, Manoj Delani from uh, Cosmos ID, I think they are making their pipeline available for the groups that are interested in exploring that. Uh, One Codex has made the made essentially a similar offer. Um, Kaijin. Uh, um, uh, Kevin just over gave an overview of that. Basically, CLC Bio is uh, they've opened up licensing. They have uh, a number of uh, specific workflows that they have made available, uh, and have uh, put together a number of tutorials for for groups that are that are interested in analyzing their own data, but perhaps don't have licenses or the necessary tool sets to do it. Um, most of these are willing to extend uh, licensing for a, a fairly long period of time. Uh, right now, CLC is offering it for 90 days, I think, but they're they're going to be fairly flexible on that, depending on a period of need. Uh, Genius has also uh, extended licensing. They've uh, they basically made a lot of the licensing that exists uh, flexible, so that if you're on a site license or floating license, uh, there's mechanisms now where you can uh, you can basically run those standalone. So that's a, that's another one to know about. Um, a number of the sequencing manufacturers have also stepped up, and there's a lot of interest right now. There's still many are still trying to figure out what the what support might look like, uh, but we've definitely heard from uh, Oxford Nanopore, Illumina, PacBio, and, and others. So uh, PacBio may not be as relevant to many of you, but uh, the other two probably are, uh, and we're still looking at what that will look like. Um, part of the reason I started that uh, that GitHub page was to really start to con condense a lot of the information around protocols and uh, some of the information that was just kind of floating out there in various Slack channels and websites and Twitter conversations and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm trying to keep it as, as current as I can. So if there's edits, if there's changes, if there's emerging best practices, let me know and we will, we will definitely make changes. But I'm really trying to crowdsource that as much as possible. Uh, and last point I'll bring up is uh, right now we're trying to coordinate a lot of the sequencing efforts uh, across the country and figure out uh, which labs are likely going to uh, at least make a, a solid effort to sequence uh, some or all of the, uh, the positives that they get through. Uh, we realize that plans may change and that, uh, as Kevin said, sequencing may be a secondary priority to, to many or something that happens a little bit later. Uh, but we're trying to figure out how to best support that. And some of that will lean on regional capacity. Some of that will lean on partner labs. Uh, like we've, uh, we've had some, some time uh, building up capacity at UCSF and, uh, and uh, with uh, Danny and Pardee's group out of road. Um, so there's a few options there. If there's an interest in sequencing uh, positive samples downstream, but not necessarily the capacity or manpower in-house to do it, uh, we're looking at how to do that best. If your lab is looking at uh, doing some level of sequencing though, and I have not talked to you, please let me know so that I can at least uh, make sure that you're looped in on some of these conversations because some of it will include uh, resources and support um, to, to, to manage that as, as you move forward. Um, hey, um, did you to, um, echo Duncan's um, points. I mean, at least here in Minnesota, sequencing is not the top priority. I think it's like the second or the third priority because um, uh, the testing is literally like a, a all hands on the deck um, scenario, but we are committed and um, we will be able to allocate some staffers time to slowly but surely to sequence of our positive specimens. Um, another stuff I want to bring out is I did share uh, Minnesota's first um, uh, batch of the Minion sequence, the raw fast pi files. Um, Kelsey should still have those um, stored at the uh, University of University of Wisconsin version of Box. Uh, anyone who wish to um, get the raw fast pi files. Um, regardless of what you want to do, either to test your bioinformatic pipeline, um, you have my uh, blessing to, to get those best. And you can contact me for access to that. Yeah, thanks to, to Minnesota and Utah for making their data available uh, to, to DCLS, because that's how I've been able to play with all these different um, assembly approaches and things like that. So that's been super helpful. Um, 
So I was wondering about the current status for diagnosis. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I'm wondering about the current status for diagnosis, like PCR diagnosis rather than the sequencing. Is, is, is this is a diagnostic test by sequencing? Right, the PCR assays. What's the, the primers people are using so far? We're developing lots of animals, some automated, um, this automated software for update the primer designs. Jason Gans is a person who is very specialized in that area. I believe he's on call as well. We have automated the entire process and tracking the latest virus strains to come up with new primer designs. But um, before we release that, we also would like to know what's the current practice, what other primers people are using. So, um, yeah. That's, yeah. This, this is a, um, a clinical assay under FDA's EUA. I think, or at least I know that all the public health labs are using the CDC protocol. Um, just get rid of the N3 target and using the N1 and N2. There, there are a number of other assays available under EUA, and clinical labs have often it, developed and, and validated their own. Uh, Nathan Gruba at Yale used to have a fairly good list of what the primers were for each one of the ones that were made public, but uh, I don't have a link off the top of my head or, uh, or know whether he's actually maintained that through, uh, you know, basically anything that becomes public. Uh, he's been adding to the list, but uh, I'll, I'll see if I can find that link and send it. Great, thanks, Duncan. At least in, in Minnesota, we, we also have the primers from um, the, the Chinese version, the um, European version, and I think the Singapore version. But we have all sort of versions, but um, I'm an actor, you need to sort of like not redevelop, but revalidate um, the primers and then utilize that for, for testing. Um, I mean, at least uh, the leadership here, we, we don't think it's worth it. Uh, and also the, the problem, the main problem right now is the shortage of the uh, um, viral RNA extraction chemicals. Uh, so just, you know, another five cents on the table. Thanks. And then Kata, I see your question in the chat there about looking at variation. Um, yeah, yeah, so even in, in generating the consensus assembly, you're sort of looking at variation with respect to the reference genome in doing that process um, in and itself. Um, and then you can compare those variations with all the other international or uh, publicly available genomes, like I said, on NextStrain um, or, you know, throughout the GenBank and things like that. Um, in terms of the specific software for, um, for, for the genome assembly, uh, I mentioned it in the slides, but what I've been using is actually um, something that uh, I adopted from the Micro Binfi International Channel. Uh, I think it was Torsten who first put it out there, um, which is mapping to the, uh, the reference genome with Minimap2, um, and then uh, doing the trimming and consensus calling with IVAR. Um, and like I mentioned, we've wrapped this into a pipeline uh, that is available with the, through uh, the SAFI toolkit. We've also containerized every single one of those resources if you want to use those um, independently. Okay, and also I have a question like uh, the primer pool is made with the reference sequence uh, genome, right? So what are the chances that the samples have some variations and uh, not all uh, uh, like uh, areas of the genome uh, is not amplified? Uh, are you checking it in between? Is there any way to check or you will know only after getting the final sequence out. I mean, the only way I've been able to tell is uh, from the PCR failures is whenever I do the assembly and I realize, okay, there are regions of the genome missing. So, I, and maybe others can speak more on this. Um, my assumption is that's like a primer dimerization rather than a mutation at the annealing site. Um, but maybe others can, you know, like I said, speak on, on their experience of what's actually happening there. There is another possibility is that uh, when you when you uh, do your pool one and pool two, you miss a well. So then you have you have your PCR. Coming, uh, next week. Oh, okay. 
and also like when uh, kevin presented he discussed like uh, trimming the primers but if you don't trim the primers again their contribution also will be there so again uh, it will be giving uh, like contributing partly to the final output right so Absolutely. don't you think that will cause any issue can you repeat that question mikada you're saying if we don't remove the primers would it be an issue Yeah. yeah because uh, as you mentioned uh, there may be some uh, sequence variations or mutations in the region of the primers so if you don't remove the primers uh, then uh, they also will be uh, like contributing to the final coverage or the final sequence that you get on the assembly um, right if if you keep the primers in your sequencing point. reads um you're forcing uh, at least um the reads that are amplified by that primer to be referenced at that position um and that's why the primers are taken out so that you're not forcing any portion of the sequence to be referenced okay. yeah and exactly that and sorry and then also just to reiterate what Aaron had said earlier removing those primers you'll you if every pcr reaction went to 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 fruition you'd still be able to recover at least the the majority of the genome because of the tiling approach and and the uh, the overlap of the uh, the amplicons and lastly i also want to know if when cdc did the metagenomic sequencing did they uh, perform any enrichment uh, steps before uh, loading it uh, or going for the library preparation or no any target uh, enrichment steps like removing the uh, rrna or uh, removing the eukaryotic dna something like that is that a question for sean maybe well then can i think i was addressed in the chat as well but i'm trying to see if i can find it okay Oh yeah, it looks like from Clint that they've been doing random prime PCR enrichment uh for metagenomic sequencing. Yeah. Okay. And also like in this uh, a protocol that has been published online by this Arctic, I see that first we are amplifying with the random hexamers and then using the primer pools. Why don't we use the uh, sequence specific primer pool in the first step itself uh, to make the cDNA so that uh, non target amplification or non target uh, uh, cdna synthesis can be minimized is it possible uh yeah venkat i i i think the 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 intent there is to try to get enough of the actual target uh rna to be present or at that point dna to be present in the sample um i'm getting a little feedback by the way on the mic um But yeah, uh, I'm not sure if it's possible. I don't know if anyone's tried it, but I think it's optimized with that in mind of getting enough target sequences oh, okay. to actually perform the experiment. Yeah. So I have the primer sequence specific primer pool uh, information online, right? Uh, to order. Uh, yes, all the information is online. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're and getting I, uh, uh, close to, go ahead, Duncan. I was about to close it out, but if you wanted to. No worries, you can close it out. I was just going to say, I, I did post a list of uh, primers. It does not include a lot of the uh, the in-house assays that people have been developing. Uh, I mean, if they have not made their primer sets public or probe sets public, uh, it's not on the list, but a lot of the initial assays, public assays are all listed there with citation. Oh, and also in in terms of depositing to these repositories, uh, that that repo also has the uh, the CDC um, SC2 resources repository also has a lot of information on um, how to submit read data um, to GI SAID and uh, NCBI as well. So thanks again, Duncan, for putting those resources all in one single place because it makes it easy to access. No problem. Uh, again, it's meant as a starting point, and so I'd really welcome feedback, especially as people walk through the submission process. 
and uh, grapple with some of the metadata fields and other things. We tried to make some, at least some initial sensible recommendations on naming conventions and, um, and metadata, but you know, we're not necessarily married. We just wanted to at least kind of give people a starting point so that they weren't starting from scratch. All right, we're getting close to the top of the hour, guys. If there's no more questions, um, you know, we can go ahead and close this chat out. I'll keep it open for the next five minutes or so. Uh, but thank you guys all for joining in on this. Uh, it's been a really productive uh, conversation. I think it's going to be one that we, we have that's, that's ongoing. Um, so for those of you who, who want to continue on uh, communication, especially if you're in the big cop community and you're not already uh, looped into things like the Staff B Slack channel, uh, please let me know um, and I can make sure that you're, you're uh, looped into that. Um, for everybody else, uh, keep doing what you're doing. This is crazy times. Um, so thank you all for being a part of the public health effort. Um, this is, uh, it's humbling to be a part of. So stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, and thanks for all your work. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin and all the team. I'll be in touch uh, with uh, what we do so that we can discuss. Thank you. Hey, Kevin.